Welcome everyone to the next episode of CRO Wisdom, the voice of risk leaders. I'm really delighted today to have Jenna Wells from Iron Mountain, a foreign marine officer who focused on signals and electronic ground intelligence and has made this career now in risk management. Jenna, welcome. Thank you, Atul. I'm, I'm so happy and honored to be here and I'm really excited for this session. So thank you for having me. So Jenna, let's let's start by talking to the audience about what is your role today? Sure. So I am, you know, my technical title or is the um, director of third party risk management. So I oversee a direct team of six um, and that is both remote and local to Boston. I am located in our headquarters, which is Boston. And I'm responsible for the implementation, the regulation and the really just the global management of Iron Mountain's third party ecosystem. Uh, which is across 50 plus countries. And it's, it's a very wide array of third parties um, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I remember, I remember this well, Jenna, when it started you in that role and now the team that you have put together, wonderful. So Jenna, one of the questions I always ask risk leaders like you is how did you end up in risk management? Because that's not where everybody started. And especially in your case, you started with the Marines. Tell us a little bit about that. I did, and, and I didn't even know risk management could be a career or a field um, in full transparency. And I'm I'm so thankful that I landed here because I feel like it was a, you know, it was actually a very natural transition. I would say with my personality, my background. So to take it a few steps back, um, I was a, a signals intelligence officer in the Marine Corps, and you know, everyone, you, it's such a risk based job and risk based mindset in the Marine Corps, especially being an officer. Um, so I I think that really helped me to have a very unique perspective that that does serve me well um, in the job today. And, and one thing I think, you know, I always say this and people laugh when they say, you know, risk management and they hear signals and electronic intelligence. I'm the most non-technical person you will ever meet. <laughs> like literally, like if I didn't need a cell phone, I wouldn't have one. And I think, you know, I, I really love and transition into risk management. And, and I promise I'll bring this all together at the end. Um, <laughs> Is it because it encompasses so many different areas, you know, and, and in the Marine Corps, I got to interact with so many different Marines, so many different uh, coalition partners, so many, you know, just different people in different areas. And so I transitioned out of the Marine Corps. Uh, I joined a private asset management firm. Um, I managed their global risk command center, uh, focusing a lot on the physical security piece. And, you know, the CCTVs and, you know, the 24-7 mm -hmm. management. Uh, I oversaw a team of 13 at that job. And during my time there, I really focused on uh, their third party team and our global third parties from a physical security perspective. And from that, I got you know really interested and I got very close with the manager for third party risk. And then when a position opened up on her team, I, I really jumped at the chance. So that allowed me to transition from just focusing on physical security, you know, to really the, the holistic risk management piece, which is physical security, information security, cyber. Uh, business continuity and disaster recovery, while still allowing me to network and interact with people from all of those fields. And that's really what I liked about it the most. I got to interact on a day-to-day -day basis, and I still do, with people across all risk areas um, and then just other areas of the firm. And, you know, procurement, uh, legal, compliance, I get to talk to everyone. Um, and I think, you know, nowadays everything is so technical. Everyone's like, well, do you just focus on cyber or information security? And I'm like, no, absolutely not, because if I did, I would go crazy. Um, <laughs> and that's why there's subject matter experts on my team that yeah. do that. And then the opportunity came at Iron Mountain to actually build their program um, and manage my own program and team, which, you know, coming from, you know, a young Marine Corps officer where I had so much responsibility and then not so much um, starting out in the civilian world and then the opportunity to build and manage a team. Um, I really couldn't ask for anything else. And, and here I am two and a half years later. So. That was a yeah. lot to follow. <laughs> no, not at all. Jenna, actually, thank you for walking through that story, because as you know, I've been involved with national security a fair amount. And one of my passions is to help veterans transition to the corporate or the civil civilian world. And I think you've actually laid a really good roadmap for those that may be interested in a career in risk management. And this field has definitely grown tremendously, especially with the attention from COVID and with supply chain issues coming up. So really thank you for that. Absolutely. So Jenna, let's, let's talk about today. And when you think about your role, when you think about other risk leaders, 
What are or what should be the priorities today to face today's risk and tomorrow's risk for that matter? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think um, priorities is, that's a hard one. Um, I think, you know, the focus on outsourcing it, is massive. And, and I think you need to be able to, to be dynamic with those priorities, if that makes sense. The environment is changing every single day with the pandemic, with the regulatory requirements, with the locations that people are working, um, the locations that your data's housed and your data's going to. So I think you need to be dynamic in your priorities and, and very agile with what you're focusing on. Um, and that's probably a very roundabout answer to your question, but but my priorities are, are maintaining, um, just maintaining a, a very acute awareness of what's going on with our supply chain. And that, you know, it's the networking piece, in my opinion, it's, and it's the aggregation and the gathering of data. And it's being able to identify those changes and then escalate and notify as necessary. So I'm very aware of, um, I'd say the 30,000 foot picture on, okay, where, you know, to take it back to COVID, where are the COVID hotspots right now? What's in yeah. lockdown? Um, okay, so let me notify the procurement teams, look at the contractual language. Let's notify the information security team of that changing, uh, you know, business continuity or disaster recovery site to make sure they track our data and that we're, you know, we're secure with our data transfer. Let's talk to the business to make sure they're having no impact. So my priority is, is being dynamic and agile, I would say, and, and making sure my team is really in the weeds of these day-to-day -day changes. So Jenna, I think you framed it really well, which is you know the dynamic and agile, and which leads to my next question. Risk management constantly evolving, right? The threats are constantly evolving, the disruptions are evolving. And so we're seeing this movement, as you know, I've been evangelizing continuous monitoring for a very long period of time. So talk to us about how should companies or how are you thinking about incorporating continuous monitoring to make sure that you are being agile and dynamic as you undertake risk? So I think the biggest thing that we're doing right now is we're trying to take continuous monitoring and expand it. And I, you know, I mean in yes, the tools that we use, but also in the awareness with the different organizations that I work with in the company. So, you know, it's not, it's not just the third party risks team to continuously monitor. Um, and, and that risk-based mindset and approach, you know, everyone, you know, that I work with probably thinks I'm the biggest broken record, but I'm like risk-based <laughs> mindset, you know, like yep. whether it be sales or procurement or risk or information security, let's take a risk-based approach to this. And we're really trying to expand that. So what my team does is we use a couple of tools um, in our continuous monitoring portfolio. Um, we have criteria for, you know, immediate alerts and immediate notification, what needs to be an immediate call, what needs to be an email. And then we aggregate that data on a monthly basis to really do a look back and say, OK, here in this last month, here's what our vendor population was doing. Um, here's some of the changes. And then here's where we see the market going. So the biggest thing for me is really just expanding that mindset, which I don't think is ever going to go away, whether it's the next pandemic or it's, yeah. you know, the continuous focus on outsourcing and in the, the changing dynamic cloud environment and where data is being transferred to, it's really just getting that message out there that this is here to stay. So let's all kind of, you know, get outside of our bubble and pay attention to this stuff and then work together. You know, if, yeah. if you know something or, you know, the business relationship owner is really the closest to that relationship. You know, my team is doing the assessment and the monitoring, but we're not working day to day with that vendor nine times out of 10. So if they notice a degradation of, um, of services or, you know, an issue happening, notify us. We'll, we'll run that through our systems. We'll reach out and maybe do a point in time assessment um, or something like that. So it's, let's, let's look at this from a holistic, you know, supply chain life cycle and, and really all be involved. Um, so I just can't focus enough on the risk-based mindset that we're really trying to impart on yeah. everyone. No, I think there's really uh, at least two great takeaways, Jenna, from what you just said. I think one being is making sure that risk mindset is embedded in all our kind of business thinking, because that's what leads to resilience. And, you know, you, you look at the record of the companies that actually continue to serve their customers because they saw risk as resilience and not just a, a cost based compliance. The second point that I'd like you to comment a little bit more on, um, Jen, I was going to ask you later, but you brought <laughs> it up. So it's perfect. So it's perfect, which is, you know, we often see risk ma management very siloed. Compliance is looking at compliance and procurement looks at financial risk and cyber looks at cyber. But you very clearly made the point 
that you are talking to all business functions, right? So you're cutting through that. Talk to us a little bit more about what has worked for you. So that could be maybe some good advice for others. Absolutely. I think what's um, what's worked for me the most is, and I'm going to bring it back to me not you know, loving the technical piece is I love to talk to people and I love to bring people together and, you know, not send an email, get someone on a call and say, no, can we just like the seven of us sit in a room and let's talk about this. So I'm very breaking down those silos um, and bringing people together and saying, first of all, this is why this is important. You know, I'm not, we're so busy, all of us, I understand that, but let's proactively look at some of these things, which might retroactively make all of our jobs easier. Um, you know, and, and also protect the company in, in a much more, um, I guess, resilient way to, to bring yeah. the resilience in. Yeah. So I would say what, what I'm focusing on now is, is breaking down those silos and then bringing us all together as a risk team. Um, you know, because there's, there's, you know, you have your compliance department looking at maybe the HIPAA and the, and the GDPR aspects of something and, and where the data is. Well, if you go to the information security team, they probably have that pretty comprehensive data diagram map. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and then if you go yeah. to the third party risk team and look at our, you know, inherent risk profile with all of the demographic information that that should really bring it together. And then you look at the contract with the addendums and the appropriate language. And and if we're doing those together in one life cycle, um, first of all, it's going to cut down your SLA time. So the business is going to like you a lot better, which, you know, <laughs> we're, we're trying to be seen not as a roadblock, you know, as a partner yeah. with the business. Um, but it makes the whole process so much easier and streamlined. Yeah. So, Jenna, um, let's talk about another challenge that we see and love your observations on that. So too often when we look at risk leaders, risk managers, they the risk domains they focus on often are cyber and then financial risk of third parties. And very rarely are they looking beyond it. Talk to us about kind of how do you think about risk domains and a wider risk aperture? Any advice for risk leaders around that? So I think Iron Mountain is probably a great example of that. Um, first of all, because we are a massive global company, but we also have, you know, a very, you know, our, our core business and what we grew from is, is shred and transport, right? So it, it's a very yeah. brick and mortar, um, important business that people don't think about much anymore because of, you know, the cloud environment and, and the scanning and, and the, the dynamic, you know, new offerings that the company has, which is amazing, but we need to really focus at Iron Mountain on all of it, right? So physical security, incredibly important. I can't even, you know, stress enough the, the physical security requirements that we have and that we that we monitor, um, background requirements and compliance requirements, because uh, we deal with hospitals and schools, you know, where there's there's HIPAA requirements and we're we're very um, heavily focused in the EU with GDPR and, and the privacy regulations. So we can't focus on one area and they all really bleed in, you know, to, to one another when you think about it. Um, if, if someone has a incredibly poor physical security department, that's a red flag. Are they, you know, are they spending enough money on cyber or maybe that's where all their money is going, which is a problem as well. So we like to see a holistic uh, view of, of risk from our, our vendors as well, right? They should be paying attention to all of it. So I would say that's that's just so important from my perspective at Iron Mountain. And, and again, we're such a unique company because we have to focus on all of that from everything from our cloud hosting providers to literally that, you know, that shred vendor in Alaska um, that no one's thinking about that. But you can't, you know, money, we don't take, obviously financial risk is incredibly important, but a vendor that you're paying five thousand dollars to can can take you down. Vice a vendor you're paying five million dollars to. So yeah. we don't use the monetary value um, as the only aspect of risk. And Jenna, that's a, that's a really good point. I think the other point that you just made is all about uh, nth parties because you know, for example, many of our uh, one of the business of customers monitors uh, many of them monitor Iron Mountain, but the reality is you are talking about your third parties, which are mm -hmm. their fourth parties. So. Jenna, um, the scope of third parties, third party risk, you know, absolutely expanding, right? Risk is dynamic, risk is agile. Uh, any observations on artificial intelligence, automation, and how you're seeing that benefit risk management? It's growing. Um, I would say that's absolutely the biggest growing field that we're seeing. Um, 
from all of our vendors as, as well as our own internal processes. Um, you know, like I said, because Iron Mountain has such a, a wide array of, of offerings that we offer our clients, but we're also seeing that from a lot of our vendors who want to introduce some of this into their day to day. So what we're doing is one staying very on top of our um, not only our annual annual reviews, but also our meetings with procurement and the forecasting reviews. Right. So we have if we have X vendor doing this for us, are they going to be doing this for us when you know we renegotiate the contract or we evolve the relationship? So it, it again, it, it's utilizing those partners to make sure one we're tracking our own evolving relationships and then also reassessing. Um, as necessary and required to make sure we're looking at those new controls because everything now is going into the cloud and it's not only going into the cloud, but it's what, what cloud, right? And, and where's that right. cloud located? And then where's that backup cloud or their hot DR site? Because is, is that crossing country borders? So with yeah. the move into AI, uh, you introduce a whole new level of risk um, and, you know, you're taking some of the physical security risk out of it, right? You're taking some of the disaster recovery or the backup site risk out of it, but you're introducing a whole new um, set of risks that, that need to be identified one and then thought about and mitigated as necessary. Yeah. And that scale just really cannot do that with humans. We have to leverage yes. automation. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's um, maybe end with a few questions around the risk profession itself. So Bloomberg, recently declared risk management, risk officer, a hot job. What do you think about that? I love it. I mean, I'll be honest, that's so that's so exciting for me because um, this is an area that I want to continue to grow in um, and continue to evolve. Um, I'm getting you know much more involved in the information security piece and in the cyber piece because I know that's where it's going. Um, and <laughs> that, that's an area that I think is also really exciting for my team. Right, because I have you know an incredible team that are focused on different areas that are now growing and and honestly never knew this was a a path for them as well. So I yeah. think you know everyone from just out of college to you know someone who you know transitioned out of the military like me in their mid to late twenties or or even later in their career, you really can take any background and bring it into risk management and bring something to the table, which I think is is so unique about this. Um, and so really special, not to be corny, you know, but about this profession where you can, anything is, you know, most jobs are applicable because you don't realize it at the time, I don't think, but there's risk in, in every day life yeah. and every job that you have that that you're mitigating and thinking about without calling it risk. So I, I think that's, you know, such a great pathway for a risk management professional where so many real world experiences um, and prior jobs are applicable. Um, right. And it's only going to grow. And if you only focus on one area, then you're in trouble. You need to me, you just you really need to be very diverse in your portfolio uh, in what you think about in what you want to do in the future. Right. That's really helpful. So, Jenna, let's focus on kind of your personal growth. What resources do you rely on to make yourself a better risk leader? All of my colleagues, um, literally all of my colleagues and my team. Um, my team continually surprises me every day. Some of them are so young and they have just these incredible ideas and, and they'll look at the program and say, I think if we, if we do this or we add this, this would be really beneficial. And it's, it's like, yes, like that is excellent observation. And then, you know, partnering so closely with my colleagues in information security and the cyber team and, you know, in areas that I'm not as well versed in as they are, um, learning from them every day and, you know, I, I'm very involved in NIST now. You know, we're a NIST shop and, and we focus so heavily on NIST. So I've been doing so much work, you know, with those teams and in the mapping and, you know, making sure it, and I'm well versed in the regulatory requirements and, and calling the legal team and and just doing all of that. So for me, it's my colleagues. They're they're absolutely invaluable in my team. Um, and just having, you know, knowing who to call. Again, it yeah. kind of goes back to, you know, I don't want to just read a white paper. I want to sit down with you and, and hear how you solved this. And, and also, how can this make my program better? And how can our programs integrate? So so definitely the people. Wonderful. So, Jenna, my, my final question, what, any other advice or what advice would you give to future risk leaders? I would just say be ready for anything um, and, and be adapt or I'm sorry, be adapt, be adaptable. 
um, be able to adapt to ever changing environments and get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and I think, you know, in doing that, that you're just going to go so far in, in this changing environment, you know, like we spoke about earlier, whether it's the next pandemic or, you know, the next natural disaster or what may be the next breach, you know, where, where there's a, a dynamic change in the regulatory environment or the way we do business, just become uncomfortable, become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And then, you know, you can just adapt and move forward. But I would also say, honestly, have fun with it and, and, and just, you know, be with your colleagues and make connections. And I think that's going to take everyone very, very far, especially in this remote environment. It's so hard, you know, to, to get on a call and, and see yeah. someone face to face. So make a point to do that. So be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. No, sorry, be comfortable with that's being right. uncomfortable. I get it. It, it talks about be ready for change, you know, be resilient. Jenna, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was really, for me, uh, it really gave me another, another insight into what makes you successful. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. To the audience, if you want to hear from leaders like Jenna Wells, Please send us our, your suggestions on who we should interview next. Until the next episode, thank you.